Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and I work with the Skate Riot Ministry as well as host the 1015 service online. These are your announcements for Sunday, May 21st. Today is the Spud Raiser. After the 8.30 and 10.15 services, you can purchase baked potatoes in the foyer. All proceeds go towards sending students to camp. Men, are you looking for some good food and conversation with other men? The next men's breakfast is Saturday, June 3rd. Invite a friend and come on out. Suggested donation is $3. The Skate Ride Annual We Foster Care Summer Picnic is coming up. We are looking for volunteers and water bottle donations. Sign up to help at the Welcome Center and water can be dropped off at the church office. If you need local pickup for your water, text the number on your bulletin. If you're interested in spiritual growth, Living Hope is the place for you. We are interested in helping people grow closer to God. On the seat back in front of you, you'll find QR codes that you can scan at any time. If you've been coming to Living Hope for a while, we'd love to get you involved in some of our ministries. You can scan the serve code and one of our ministry leaders will contact you. If you're interested in supporting Living Hope with your tithes and offerings, you can scan the give code or you can put your tithes and offerings into the black boxes at the back of the sanctuary after the service or you can visit our new church website. We're really excited that you're here to worship with us and we hope that you have a great week. Amen. As you sit down, you have the elements for communion there at your seat. We want to take a time to do communion right now, Lord's Supper. Uh, we invite all who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior to participate in taking of the elements. And uh, the Bible's pretty clear about this as well. Paul tells us that we should examine our hearts. If we have issues of sin in our life, issues with other people, that as followers of Jesus, it's okay to not take of the elements. We have to make sure that we are right before God and let God speak to you through those things as well. So it's okay not to take them. And I just want to encourage you uh, with that thought as well. But if you're ready to take them, go ahead and take the bottom and peel out the wafer. And on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to take communion, to do what Jesus gave us, to remember him, to remember his sacrifice on our behalf, in our place, and to proclaim it until he comes back. Lord, we do not take this lightly. We ask you to examine our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take, eat the body of Christ. In the same way also, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you take of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take, drink the blood of Christ. Lord, thank you for this brief time that impacts our lives every single day. May we proclaim it. May we celebrate it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. The book of Matthew, chapter 5. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Great time of worship this morning. 
Lord, as I pray every week, I pray I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are going to begin your Bible, if you're here and stay with us, is going to get very used to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount. And so just get used to it, having that little bend right there. Uh, we're going to walk through this verse by verse over the next several months. And so we'll talk more about it as we go along this morning. I read through verse 10. Many of you know the Beatitudes. We're going to cover those one by one as we go through this. Today I just want to deal with the first two verses and give an introduction to this series that we're calling Kingdom Culture. The greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived is what many people call the Sermon on the Mount. That's why they call it that. What Jesus shared here has had a profound impact on Christianity and non-Christians alike throughout the centuries. Gandhi was a huge fan of the Sermon on the Mount. Proponents of what they call the social gospel like to use the Sermon on the Mount as a way to usher in the kingdom of heaven. And then guys that weren't followers of Jesus, guys like Karl Marx, the creator of, originator of capitalism and those socialism and those concepts of government and life like to take these concepts but just gave them a more uh, secular perspective on those things. Anabaptists, Anabist means re, they were called rebaptizers, that means Anabaptists, took a literal interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount and they used it to, uh, in the civil sphere, and it made them pacifists. They didn't believe in war and fighting in war. So there's all kinds of ways that it's been taken and understood over the centuries from when it was given. These words from Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, they're a manifesto for a new community, for a realized kingdom that Jesus was bringing together, and how the people in the kingdom should live, and how they should think about the world and the realities of the world in which they live. It's about a culture that needs to be created, and we call that, we're calling that a kingdom culture. So in this introduction, I need to do several introductions before we get going and into the series starting next week. The first thing is an introduction to terms, terms that you're going to hear throughout as we look at Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The first one is this idea of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven as he's trying to reach his gospels intended for a more Jewish audience. And to say God for them, for some, would have been offensive. So he changed from God to instead of saying kingdom of God, like Luke says, he says kingdom of heaven. It's the same thing. They're interchangeable terms for us. What is the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's the present and future rule and reign of Jesus. Jesus is king. Thank you, four people. Jesus is king. Amen. And this kingdom is not a geographical entity, although it is manifested through space and in time through the community of faith that is called the church. We are a part of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The church is called to work out and live out this culture, the culture that Jesus will describe in these three chapters. We're called to fulfill its purposes, both personally, socially, and institutionally. And that progression is intentional. As we read, as you'll hear me say, I'm sure, a couple of times this morning as we go through this, Jesus starts with this. Jesus starts 
with the heart. It all starts with the heart. If the heart's not changed, forget trying to live this out socially. It's not going to happen. And forget trying to change it institutionally. And for the life of me, Christians have tried to do this for centuries and, and really get frustrated when I say things like this, but trying to usher in a Christian culture in a non-Christian society and think that you're going to be able to do that by changing laws or changing presidents or elected officials is never going to happen. It is chasing after the wind. It is quite frankly borderline idolatry if it's not idolatry to begin with. Jesus is intentional in his delivery of this message, and he starts with the heart. You can't change anything until this gets changed. Culture, it's the way of life, the customs, the belief, the practices of a particular group of people at a particular time and place. The church is called to live out the kingdom in the world around us. We should have our own culture Jesus' kind of culture. We all have culture. You know your house has its own culture? Your home has its own culture. Amen? Amen. The high desert has its own culture. I mean, even in the high desert, there's a different culture between Hesperia and Apple Valley and Victorville and Atalanto. There is. There's a different culture in Southern California. There's a different culture in Hollywood. There's a different culture in the South. There's a different culture in the Northeast. There's a different culture in Texas. They all have a unique culture to them. As followers of Jesus, as the church, we are to live out this kingdom culture no matter where we're at, and no matter where we live, and amongst the culture in which God has placed us. And our culture is supposed to have influence on the world around us, not that culture having influence on us. And let's just be honest, we struggle with that. And then finally, ethic. Ethic is a set of moral principles or values that govern or control behavior. There's an ethic. You have an ethic. You may think everything is okay until something happens to you that ain't okay, and all of a sudden your ethic kicks in. Amen. You may not be bothered by what other people do until what they do bothers you. All of us live a life in which we create for ourselves ethical boundaries, boundaries of right and wrong. And quite frankly, for most of the time, those things are subjective. Jesus takes that subjectivity away from us as followers of Jesus because he's given us his word, and more specifically in our context for this, for the next few months, he's given us Matthew 5, 6, and seven. Amen. This is the Word of God. Amen. What you think is right and what you think is wrong is not, and neither is mine. People always come to me and they say stuff like, how come you just preach verse by verse through books of the Bible, which I don't just do that, but the reason I do that is because that's the Word of God. My words don't change anybody. God's Word does. God's Word is living and powerful and more active and, you know, sharp sword and all that, bones and marrow, very violent language there. And even when I preach what we would call topical, which I don't mind, I usually do it from a text. We talked Mother's Day last week from Proverbs 31. All my points came right from the verses we read. 
We do not in this church preach one verse and maybe come back to it at the end. We don't do that here. I won't let Pastor Carlos do it. I don't let Pastor Tim do it. I won't let anybody come here and do that. What they come with is a word from the Lord. But there's an ethic. Jesus gives us ethics and moral principles here. You don't have to like them, and I don't have to like them. But we're supposed to live by them. And we'll talk through that as we get through these things. So let me give you an introduction to the scene here. It says, Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. If you go back and look at Matthew 4, you see that he had just he was baptized in Matthew 3. The Holy Spirit draws Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he goes through that in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then he comes back and he starts ministering in Galilee. He starts teaching. He calls the first disciples. He starts teaching, preaching, and healing and all of these things. And all of a sudden, he starts getting a whole lot of attention. And as Jesus was often wanting to do, when he drew a lot of people, he'd pull away. He pulled away from this crowd with a purpose. So he pulls himself away and he sits down. Why did he sit down? Because rabbis taught sitting. That was the position of authority back in the day. I was thought about just bringing a table and a chair up here and doing it for the next seven months. I may still do that. But that was the authority position back, back then. Then it says... His disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, and off we go. It is important to note as we read this that it says the disciples came to him. So you have Jesus going up on the mountain. You you have the disciples saying, oh, Jesus is going up there. If we're followers of Jesus, I guess we should go where he is. They follow them up there. The crowds see them up on the hill, and they work their way up as well. This sermon, this teaching, whatever term you got to use to listen to it, is for the disciples. The crowd just gets to listen in. Because what Jesus is going to talk about, the crowd can't understand. The disciples can barely grab the concepts as we read through the Gospels. But the disciples have already been chosen by Jesus. And their minds have already begun to be opened to the truth of what Jesus was about to teach them. The rest of the crowd was going to hear stuff like, blessed are the poor in spirit, as we'll look at next week, and say, what? What? Just as many of us would say, what? But the disciples would have another level of understanding. That's just the nature of how God's Word works. You need the Spirit. You need Jesus to illuminate your mind to these truths. So always remember that the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher ever was actually to a very small audience. The others just got to listen in and hear it. So that's the scene that we'll be at for the next. This was probably, this is probably just a a Reader's Digest version of the Sermon on the Mount. Many believe that he preached a lot longer than I preach, folks. (laughs) Praise God. Many people thought that this message went on for two to three hours. Why? Jesus had a lot to say. Amen. Amen. And so there, on the top of the mountain, he begins to usher in and teach, really, about how to change the world. There's a structure to the message. Matthew 5, 13, 3 through 16 is the introduction, the Beatitudes that I read this morning. Then you go down and talk about salt and light. That's just the introduction. 
I mean, that's like, boom. Matthew 5, 17 through 7, 12 is the body. There's explanation, illustration, application of everything that Jesus has talked about. As leading up, there is a structure that he's flowing through. Jesus is intentional with every word he's saying and the order in which he says it. And he starts with the Beatitudes because, like I said to start, it starts here. If he'd have started with, if you look at a woman, it's adultery in your heart already, people would have just been, what? He starts with the heart. And then he has a conclusion there, Matthew 7, 13 to 27. And if you look at that, it just basically comes down to there are two foundations on which you can live your life. And for him, in the context of what he's talking about, there is the foundation of Jesus and his words, and there's the foundation of the scribes and the Pharisees and the world out there. And he says there's a choice. See, that's the big difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching says you got to make the choice about what was just said. And ultimately that you have to answer to God for the decisions that you make. And we all know that that's true. Amen. So there's the introduction to the message, to the scene, to some terms that are going to carry through there. Now let me get into some thoughts that we need to think about as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount over the next several months. This sermon does not teach men and women how to get into the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't. This sermon is all about what you do when you're in there. Because without the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are unattainable. And that's what many of the the people were listening were listening, even the disciples, like, man, this is, how are we supposed to do that? That's kind of the point. We'll talk about that next week. Remember, in that world, in that time, the teachings of of Jewish society and Jewish religion, which is where this is taking place, many of them believe, and even those outside of that, they believe that it is what you do to appease God that gets you to where God is. If you do this, then God will bless you. And Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is setting up that view against his view. That's why when he talks about stuff and he says things like, uh, when you give, don't do it so other people can see you. When you pray, don't pray like they do. When you fast, if you fast, don't do it like they do. Why? Because everything about religion and practicing your religion in that world and in that time was all about outward appearance to appease and find favor with God. And unfortunately today... In the church and outside of the church, many people still hold that view. Many of you may be in this room today because somebody along the way told you along the lines, if I give God my hour and 15 minutes today, I will appease him for the week so that he'll leave me alone. Many of you in here think that. I know you do. I talk to you. You don't have to say it directly. I hear it in how you respond to the questions that are asked. I'm I'm just here to to get my Jesus thing on, and then I'm going to go out and be the rest. God God will be good as long as I'm I'm giving him my iron 15. Really? Who told you that? It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't Jesus. And that's what Jesus is getting at in the... Sermon on the Mount. He's getting at this outward acts with no heart change or nothing. Later on, he calls the Pharisees and the scribes, he calls them whitewashed tombs. 
He calls them cups that are clean on the outside. All of us with kids can relate to that. But on the inside, you are as filthy and dark and black and dangerous as anything. He's very clear that outward acts without heart transformation don't mean a thing. And he shows that in the Sermon on the Mount. But rather than how men and women should live in the kingdom, it's about how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to be poor in spirit. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you next week. Well, how are we supposed to be blessed when we mourn? I'll talk about what blessed means, because I know many of you think you know what blessed means, but when you go to truly fully understand the term, you'll find out that you're falling way short. And a lot of that's on us as preachers and teachers because we've stayed on the shallow end of that pool as well. But I'm not going to do that. We're here for seven months. We might as well get it all right, correct? Amen. The teaching of the sermon is to be applied personally today as citizens of the kingdom of heaven now. Okay, so here's the thing you got to do. If you stick it out, and I pray you do, whether online or here in person, I'm going to challenge you to do a couple things. In your devotional time, once a week, read the whole thing. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. People are just like, what? Read three chapters of the Bible sitting down at once? What? Pastor, I get the three verses. And I'm like, that's not a problem with the Bible. That's a problem with you, bro. Or sister. Read the whole thing. It's a sermon. We're going to break it down verse by verse, but it was intended to be listened to in one sitting. Read it that way. It's 10 minutes tops. Let God do something. I know guys infinitely smarter than me who are, every time they preach, and then they preach the Sermon on the Mount, a ton of time. They say it changes them every single time. It's because you are confronted with every verse about who you are and where you're at about what the realities of this world that we're living in, are supposed to live in, are, and to live it out. Amen. There's another concept to think through. Though there is now a now not yet reality to our citizenship, we're in the kingdom of heaven now, but our citizenship is in the future. But we're kingdom citizens now. We won't see what this fully looks like until we get to heaven. Amen. This kingdom of heaven that we look forward to, this kingdom of heaven that gives us our hope that we have every single day, we won't know what it's fully like until we get there. Philippians 3.20, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven. And then it says, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there. Not here. That Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians should not be looking for saviors on planet Earth. Whether from politics or pop culture. Amen. Amen. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, 
May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. What a great phrase. They ought to name a church that. Oh, I'm sorry. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Where is it at? Kept in heaven for you. We are ushered into the kingdom by faith in Christ. We are to live out the kingdom while we're still here. But we have to always remember what Peter tells us, that this is not our home. We are sojourners. We're just traveling through. Our hope does not come from this. Our hope comes from what is to come. The inheritance you're waiting for from your parents you hope to get stays here. It doesn't go with you in heaven. And it doesn't compare to what heaven has for you and for me. And what this does is it gives us hope in the most difficult times of the life we live especially at death. We've had a couple of 90-year-olds pass away this week in the life of our church. Faithful, faithful, been faithful to this church for decades. They passed away. All of them, both of them, all of them, I'll say all of them, were ready to go home. They're ready to go home. Now, I get when you're young. Believe it or not, I was young once. You don't want to think about heaven when you're 21 and you got the world at your feet. But our hope is in heaven. And death is just our passport to where we want to go. And I get that it's hard to grasp that when you're young and you want to take on the world and do all of those things and grab it all, whatever, whatever the world is telling us to do these days. But the Bible says that our inheritance is in heaven. And the older you get, even with the more stuff you have, the older you get, the more you look forward to that which I have never seen before in my life. You look forward to, even though I live in a great house, I look forward to the house that Jesus is building for me, according to John 14. I look forward to the decorations and interior design, as wonderful as my wife is at all that, that Jesus has done for me. And I look forward to the inheritance that he died to give me. That's the perspective. And, but until we get to that point, Jesus has lived this way. Jesus says, this is how God thinks about you. This is how God thinks about the world. This is how God thinks about all this stuff. The kingdom of heaven is to be influencing the world, not the world influencing the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And I get how we struggle with that and what that looks like. Jesus helps us. We just have to respond to it, right? Right? Like I said earlier, we don't have to like it. We just got to figure out how to live with it. So that's an important concept to remember as we talk about this. Topics. What can you cover in three chapters, Pastor Rich? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. 
Look at this. In these three chapters, we will cover attitudes, not this attitude either, although we'll probably come to that. We'll talk about love. We'll talk about the inner man. We'll talk about following Jesus or discipleship, conflict, giving. Say it with me. Giving. Everybody smirks at that. Giving. Y'all got to smirk at Jesus when it comes to giving, folks. And it's actually more about what he gives you than what you're supposed to give to him. That's what it says. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given unto you. And just because you ain't got your Lamborghini Countach yet, don't be crying to God about it. Amen. Works. Obedience. Opposition. How to deal with enemies. Discernment. Loyalty. Money. Rewards. Judgmental attitudes. Wisdom. Materialism. Mercy. Prayer. Truth. Reality. Flattery. Hypocrisy. Forgiveness. And where true security lies. All of that we will touch on. In three chapters. In one sermon. Man, can you imagine how small the font would be if I did that? That's pretty small right there, Liz. i got to be honest with you on that one. Y'all can live with it. Hit the magnifier on your phone. That's what you got it there for. Anyway, because next week's I think is more. (laughs) Y'all don't find that funny? Just, it's a lot of scripture. So we're going to cover a lot of ground over the next three chapters, over the next several months. So let me just talk about some things theologically as we come to our time here. Matthew is seeking to show Jesus as a new and greater Moses. That's the audience he's addressing. He's addressing Jewish people. People who thought of Moses as the great prophet, the great deliverer, all of those things. Jesus is the greater lawgiver and the greater prophet that is promised in Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. This is what you requested from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not continue to hear the voice of the Lord our God or see the great fire any longer, so that we will not die. Then the Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, from among their brothers. And he did. I will put my words in his mouth. You know what's interesting about that? Jesus himself tells us that he did not speak his own words, but only those words that the Father told him to speak. Wow, that's kind of a prophetic fulfillment right there in the book of Deuteronomy. And he will tell them everything I command him. It's funny, Jesus said, I don't even do my own thing. I only do the things that my Father tells me to do. Wow, there's two prophecy fulfillments from the book of Deuteronomy about Jesus, about a prophet to come who wouldn't speak his own words, wouldn't even do his own thing, and there we are. I will hold accountable whoever does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name. Sounds like judgment there. Jesus does not shy away from judgment, and neither should we. But the prophet who presumes to speak a message in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. Jesus said there was going to be wolves among the sheep. 
You want to know why I preach the Bible? It keeps me close to God's Word. The Sermon on the Mount is a, is a charter for our conduct as followers of Jesus. At any time and in any age. This doesn't just apply to the gospel, to this time period. It applies to us now. That's why God put it in his word. Amen. This means to us that God's kingdom is inaugurated in the first century, currently present in and among us as the church now, and is still awaiting its full consummation when Jesus comes back. And that's how we are going to approach the book, the three chapters, the sermon. John Donne is a theologian, poet from a long time ago, but he says this, As nature hath given us certain elements, and all our bodies are composed of them, and art hath given us a certain alphabet of letters, and all the words are composed of them. So, our blessed Savior, in these three chapters of this gospel, hath given us a sermon of text, of which all our sermons may be composed, all the articles of our religion, all the canons of our church, all the injunctions of our princes, all the homilies of our fathers, all the body of divinity is in these three chapters, in this one Sermon on the Mount. Now, let me wrap this up really quickly by just saying this. I told you in the beginning, this sermon is for the disciples for them to begin to grasp what Jesus was going to do, is doing, and to understand. So you, to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, is to believe in Jesus. It's to believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus. That Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. That he came in humanity, born as a baby, lived a perfect, sinless life. What do you mean Jesus lived a sinless life? Jesus did not sin, or his death on the cross didn't do a thing for us. Amen. He taught, he healed, ushered in the kingdom. The religious leaders didn't like it. He was starting to get really popular, and they made up this big old trial for him that was a sham in and of itself, all part of fulfilling Scripture. And he went to a cross, and he died on that cross. And now, well, for the Roman government, that was just dealing with a possible insurrectionist and to keep the Jews from causing a whole lot of havoc in this crazy area called Judea. But for all of mankind, it was the atonement for what we have as a problem before God, and it's called sin. What is sin? It's not measuring up to God's standard. Most people would say that they are, we, can't, we don't do that, I'm not perfect. I can, get, I can get most of you all in this room to say I'm not perfect. Maybe a couple teenagers, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> and certainly before God. It is to understand what we'll talk more about next week. That sin keeps you separated. It's what keeps you from enjoying heaven. To know that you're going to heaven. These aren't my words, folks. This is Jesus' words. This is Paul's words. Paul tells us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all in Greek. That includes you and me. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. You can't have enough people cross 
the street, help them across the street. You can't give enough to the Salvation Army or to whatever else philanthropic cause that you think is justifiable and worthy. None of that, none of that, none of that gets you or me into heaven. None of it. You mean if I do all that, but maybe I like, maybe I like took a pencil from work, which is technically stealing. Which is how God would see it, by the way. Stealing is a sin. That's one sin. One sin keeps you out. I don't make these rules. This is God. That's why Jesus came to die. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And then the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because the wages of sin, according to Romans 6.23, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. A free gift. Free gift is what we call grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you are saved by, through faith, not of works, so that no man can boast. Verse 10 says, Because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do those things which God has prepared in advance for us to do. It is by grace. It is by grace. You can do nothing to earn heaven. Quit Trying. Quit trying. Quit saying to people who come and ask you about Jesus, well, I'm basically a good person. I think that'll get me in. You think wrong. You think that way about yourself. Guess what? If that's the measure, there's always somebody better than you. And by the way, that ain't me. <laughs> And receive a gift. Romans 10, 9, and 10. But God demonstrates his own love for us. And then while we were still sinners, Christ died. Well, I said that already. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. Amen. So what do you got to do? What do you got to do to understand the kingdom of heaven? You got to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Well, how do I do that? It's acknowledging yourself before God. We say pray. It's a posture. It's, it's talking to God. Who cares what you tell me? It's what you tell him that matters. Amen. And what you say is, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know it. But this guy up here keeps telling me that I'm not good enough. I think he's right. He says, if I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. I believe, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And it's funny how people who, who sell, tell say that first thing will always say, I always believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And why are you saying you're working to get to heaven and that you're basically a good person to get there? You contradict yourself. And we know the answer to that is because we don't want to be called a Jesus freak. We'd rather just be told we can earn it. God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead three days later. He walked out of that tomb. I don't have time to get too involved in it. There is more evidence for the reality of the resurrection than half the junk you guys believe on Instagram. <laughs> and in, in your heart, remember, it all starts in the heart. You make him Lord and Savior. Well, I don't understand what all that means. I didn't either. I just know I needed to do that. That's why we're here. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never made Jesus Lord and Savior, right where you're at, online, right where you're at, I don't know where you're at, but you're here listening right now. From your heart, the Spirit is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit of God. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. And God, today I make him Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. And Lord, uh, I pray your spirit acknowledges that truth 
in their heart so that they know without a shadow of a doubt the kingdom of heaven is now their home. Lord, give them the courage to talk to me or talk to Pastor Tim or somebody or to scan the barcode that they're in front of, that's there in front of them and just give us information so that we can begin this journey together as we begin this journey together through the Sermon on the Mount to learn what it is to have a kingdom culture. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's all stand. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has a great thing. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has a great thing. He has the so much for joining us. You are dismissed.